Jennifer, you're live. Please take it away. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone tuning in from around the world. My name is Jennifer, and I'm a product marketer at EVBox. And I want to wish you all a big welcome to the special installment of EVBox webinars here to celebrate our 10th anniversary. So today we'll be sharing stories and insights about EV charging product design, which is what you're all here for. So let's take a look at the agenda first and see what you're up for. So if we can go to the agenda, we'll see that we're here right now with some welcome words. Um, we're going to have three polls to keep things interactive, interspersed throughout today's hour. And in the first part of the hour, we're gonna be talking about the early days, which is going to be EVSE product design from 2010 to 2015. Then we're going to progress into the second half of the decade, where we talk about the designs moving forward from now. And in the last part, we're gonna discuss the future and speculate what kind of features and what kind of design elements will we expect from products in the future years to come. There is going to be chances to ask questions. Um, we have Q&A parts and also discussions with our guests. So in the chat box, you can send in your questions and we'll have someone moderating them so that we're able to also ask some of those questions live to our experts who will be with us today. Before we get started with the first section of our agenda, we want to already launch our first poll for everyone to uh, respond to. And that question is, which EV bus charging station did you first get to know? So we've got a variety of answers there from the business line, home line, the LV, public line, Icon, Tronic, and Ultronic. So put in that answer there um, while we wait for the answers to roll in. My first uh, experience with EV box stations is actually the public line when I first moved to Amsterdam. And I realized that all of those uh, charging stations around the city were part of the company that I would eventually get to work with. But that was exciting. And now we've got the answers. Interesting. So 37% of you first witnessed the business line station, which is, um, of course, because that is an iconic station of ours, it's been with us for the longest. And uh, 31% in second place, a uh, new LV. And in third place, uh, most recognized there is the public line station. Very cool. So a lot of our AC charging products are the ones that you know us for. Super, so if we go on to the next part here, I'd like to introduce very briefly our speakers. Today, we're going to have Ugo and Vinand from EV Box who have been with EV Box for quite some time and have witnessed the product design evolution here. And we'll also have Bas from Van Berlo, which is our partner in product design. And I will give them a more detailed introduction in a short while. So in the past 10 years, we've seen quite an increase in EV adoption, which has obviously led to increased demand in EV charging infrastructure. Similar to, let's say, cell phones, where some of us may remember the heavy brick mobile phones back in the day, as technology developed, substance gave to style, and the mobile phones we see today are sleek, they're beautiful, and dare I say, some of them can be quite sexy. Of course, those still come uh, with the functionalities that are increasing today there. EV, pro EV boxes products reflect that of the growth in our industry as well. So as you can see on the left on the slide there, our station started off with a bit more of a functional design that's quite clear in our original design principles. And over the last 10 years, we've made moves to progress to a more um, usable and aesthetically pleasing type of design without sacrificing functionality and we're going to talk a little bit about how we get there today. But first, I would love to spend a little bit of time just understanding the origin. So this is the first part of our webinar here. Um, at this point, I'd love to call up Ugo and Vinant, who are some of the veterans, and to share a few stories about the conception of our first EV box charging station, the business line. So Ugo, uh, I'd love to hear how you were first introduced to our products when you joined the company. Yes, thanks uh, Jen for hosting this special webinar as well and thanks everyone for, uh, for joining it. Uh, it's exciting to see everyone excited about seeing the product design of EV Box Group and I hope you can hear me well. So I, I recall joining over five years ago when EV Box was pro approximately 15 engineers, uh, pretty much passionate about building the technology 
for what they believe, and we still believe today, was a big transition towards electric mobility. And uh, I, I recall very clearly because I was new to the industry and I was new to you know the whole concept of charging stations. So um, it was a lot of technical jargon on the first days from engineers, and I still recall having to learn about AC, DC, um, smart charging, all at it at once. But the thing that fascinated me from the very beginning was the clear understanding that design and charging stations are more than what you see up front and up close, that there's a whole world behind it that is quite fascinating. So I got very excited about the possibilities that it brings to, to customers, to drivers, that we are developing a technology that serves the greater good of, of having a zero emission world, of having sustainable mobility, and it can accelerate that um, through that transition. And so I got very excited about the charging station. Uh, I knew that the design was very special from the beginning. I got the first presented to the business line, but similar to you, Jennifer, I actually was walking on the cities of Almir and Amsterdam and I saw all the, all the charging stations. And at the beginning, I didn't even know they were charging stations. Uh, uh, but once I noticed the first one, I recall that there were so many of them. And, and it was quite fascinating and empowering. And, and I got, yeah, I got very excited about the idea of building a product that, uh, that will excite also the people that adopt electric mobility. And, and the business line was that example, which, uh, which was, had a very strong connection to the Dutch culture, culture and heritage, which I think Vina knows more of. Yeah, I guess from there, we can pass it over to Vina. And can you maybe tell us a little bit more about the design of the business line? And for those of you who are not familiar, the right side there, that was the business line. Yeah, so actually interesting story, uh, the, the business line and um, typical Dutch heritage. Uh, as you see uh, the picture of the tulip on the left, actually the nickname of the business line in the beginning was the tulip. Um, and there's, there's a reason behind because our founder CEO um, <clears throat> arranged uh, basically that these products were uh, mainly developed and made in the Netherlands and really wanted to give that Dutch origin to the, to the product. That's why it, its design of the double business line uh, re reflects the design of the tulip and it's actually called uh, the tulip. Yeah, very cool. Actually, uh, when I was first told that story, I didn't recognize a tulip shape, and now I can't unsee the tulip in all the business lines that I ever passed by. Yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it, it, it's really, once you know it, you, you can't unsee it anymore, so. Yeah, actually, I don't know if there's an animation that might show up, perhaps if that can be triggered. Well. Even if not, you can clearly see um, there is some resemblance there to the shape of the tulip and the shape of business lines. So thank you, Vana, for sharing that uh, fun story about the stations. Um, so I think, at, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the stations can be quite uh, functional back in the day. They were really meant to serve the purpose of uh, being able to charge cars, charge electric cars. But of course, uh, things have evolved since then. So at this point, I'd love to call out our second poll. Um, which is going to be a multiple select poll where you're able to pick what you think are the three most important characteristics of an EV charging station. So most of these that you can see are may not be um, quickly recognized as physical features, but they're all tied into the development of a product. So you can click through the options. There's durability, reliability, aesthetics, innovative features, ease of use, ease of installation, um, being online and connected, dynamic load management, and cost. So those are different things that go into design. And even though, again, some of them might not sound like design elements, they're definitely part of the whole picture. Great, so now we've got some results coming back. Um, in first place, just by a slim 2% more, we've got ease of use as being the most important element. And that's really important, especially for adoption those people who may or may not have ever seen a charging station before. We've also got reliability in second place, which is definitely something that uh, it, it's a high focus. If you get to a charging station, you need it to work. And in third place, well, those were the clear top two, but we've also got uh, features like dynamic load management and durability that kind of come in at 
uh, third and fourth place right there. Very cool. So at this point, I'm going to transition into the second part of our webinar, where we're going to talk a little bit more. We're going to focus on the second half of the decade, which is the fun part of um, all the development so far. So over the last five years, um, we've done quite a bit of research and studies into learning about how we can better develop our stations. And at this time, I'm going to be calling up our speakers one by one, and they're going to be giving you a five minute presentation each um, to answer different elements about product design. So first off, we have Hugo Pereira. He is the chief growth officer working for EDBox since early 2015 and has tons of hands-on experience in the field of strategy, leadership development, and all linking up to scaling up and growth for the past 10 years. So Hugo is going to be talking a little bit more about the development of what we call a product DNA. Hugo, over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so, so one of the things that I find extremely interesting when developing the products, and I, I think it's equal to a lot of people that are here, and maybe as, as a fun fact, I, I'm a gadget lover, you know, so I, I love to purchase and test gadgets. Um, even recently, I, I got the opportunity and, and a happy chance of, uh, of, uh, of moving to a new apartment, of acquiring a new apartment. And the most exciting part was to choose which gadgets am I going to introduce to the house from, I don't know, automated vacuum cleaner to, I don't know, smart lamps, that whole technology development that comes there. And one of the things that I found fascinating, fascinating was independently of what you're looking on a gadget, there is a trend on, on developing products that are not just about how they look, but how they work. And I think that's one of the first things that I noticed on a DNA, the DNA, is about building an experience. And every different product has to be built, taking into account who they are serving and who they are building for happiness for. So we, when I joined the organization, we had been developing charging stations and the related software for already six years. And the company had brought to market the business line, the home line, the public line into what was regarding to the AC charging. And then we were thinking about the future of the industry. And and the customer feedback and what makes products successful as well as how can we express our brand and our vision through what we develop. Fun fact, we kicked off a project that Vinan was part of, which was called a project pepper because we want to spice things up and we start looking at what makes products successful. What is a design language that guides the philosophy of what makes products last for a long time. Um, and I think like every, a lot of the thought leaders and decision makers that are probably on this webinar, we, we looked into the decision makers. We look at the, at the customers and who we are serving. One of the interesting things that when you're building charging stations, specifically for the industry, is that we are serving multiple stakeholders. And that's something that has to be taken into consideration. And in the early phase of the industry was not always taken into account. Yeah, so some, uh, some, uh, some companies, EVBox and beyond EVBox, some competitors and partners, they built for the functional part of it, for the installers. Some pe people built for the user with, you know, great features like, I don't know, face recognition, other things, because they want to be like the user, the driver. And some built for, uh, for the larger corporations, you know, more looking at the back end and not so much of the design and how it looks. The way we saw it is that we want to serve the whole industry. And that's why you look at the DNA that brings the best out of what we know. And so if you look at the three main areas, we start with reliable. And if you look at the survey now, about 65% of the people found reliable as a critical aspect because it is critical for the industry because reliability is about trust. And in an, in an era where we were dealing with the range anxiety, where we are dealing with uncertainty about the industry, even in today's times, drivers, consumers, businesses need to trust that it works, that you can go wherever you go, that you can charge efficiently, and that the technology is built for a purpose and that it is secure and safe. And that's why it's the bigger bubble that is there, because it's the one that sets the foundation for everything else. The most important part is that the business can trust the station to be working, to manage the uh, energy efficiently, that the software can, can drive the business requirements, but that the user also can trust that it will work when it gets there. The second uh, look that you are there is the one of intelligence. And we are in the era of Internet of Things. It's more than just hardware. It's a fast-paced innovation that we are dealing today. Hardware models, firmware development, software development, cloud-based, 
we need to see that there is a notion that we are developing smart hardware and smart charging, that we are looking at an industry that will grow tenfold, that today has near 10 million EVs on the road by the end of 2020, but is expected to have maybe 100 million by the end of 2025. Um, so that means that the mass that is coming requires us to be intelligent, but also imaginative. And when we were developing EV box icon that we are bringing to market now with the first installations, we look at also how it can be easy to maintain, to serve, how it can be built to be remotely maintained. And that's the imagination part of things, how it can be connected to energy management systems, look at the future of vehicle to grid. So that's one of the other items that is there. And then last but not least is about accessibility. User adoption is one, one of the most important criteria to have users trusting in what we build. Ease of use, as you saw, was another element of with 60% of requirement. It needs to be easy to use, but needs to be sincere. What you see is what you get. If you need a charging cable, it needs to be intuitive and built for frequent use. But also means that we build for everyone. We think about everyone independently of their situation. So well, wheelchair accessibility is also important. So those are all the elements of it. And if you see the round area of the DNA, we build to be sophisticated strong intellectual property development, well-designed, but also easily branded, recognized by the industry. It is an EV box station that is a sense of quality, of reliability, of intelligence, but that customers and partners and the industry can also brand for their own brand expression, that they can see that I can also see my brand be applicable here. That flexibility is quite important and that's how we see the DNA of everything we built, not just on the initial charging stations that were regular, but also Back in 2018, when we added the fast charging stations to our family with EVtronic, uh, and now to the EV box, of course, it, we naturally didn't speak the whole language. So having a DNA defines the guiding elements that allows us to come back and ask, okay, if now we have to make the net, next iteration of products and models, then we need to know what differentiates us, what serves the industry, and how we get these guidelines that allows us to build for the future because everything we are building today, we also want to be used in five, 10 years time. So it has to be future-proof, international and scalable. So that's the elements of the DNA that we build today. And that's how, we, uh, how people should read what EVbox tries to develop both on hardware, software, but also, so, uh, also services. This is where we are directing ourselves and what we also want to be accountable for and what we want also customers, partners, even competitors to come back to us demanding this DNA to be present in everything we built. So, so that's the story behind the DNA, which will serve for also any business customer or partner or even competitor that wants to build their own way of addressing the industry. So back to you, Jennifer, on this part of the story. Thank you for sharing that, Ugo. Indeed, the product DNA is ingrained in everything that we do within the product teams. So speaking of product, we're going to hand it over next to our next guest. So Voinan Diemer, he's our Director of Product Management and has been working for EVbox since early 2016. He's active in the fields of engineering, product development, and product management of B2B and B2C products with the link to sustainability. And he's been doing all of that for the past 18 years. We're very grateful to have him on board and here going to speak about user research. Over to you, Wynand. Thanks, Jennifer, uh, for hosting and for, uh, for inviting me uh, today in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, yeah, been at EV Box for a little bit over, over four years and, and well, addition to Hugo, we're going to be talking about uh, user experience, user-centered design and how we embed this in, into our products and we have a nice example uh, here, but um, I'd like to take a little bit of a step uh, step back and, and look at EV box um, philosophy on, on product development uh, first also to give the audience a little bit of an insight on, on what we're focusing on um, because at the end of the day we're, we're really focusing on user-centered design but there are some critical parameters which we use to um, realize this and one of the things here is that within EV box from day one from the foundation of the company in 2010, we focused basically on platform, platform technology-based uh, ecosystems. So 
this is really uh, at, at the core of all our products and that is also what makes our product scalable. So today we're at the fourth generation electronics platform, which we use as a, as a technology together with um, our cloud-based uh, charging management platform and the services packages, which we can wrap all up into one proposition and, and offer to our users. Um, we're also working on next generations of products where, where we have the same focus. Uh, and basically, the idea to do this uh, platform-based um, is that we realized early on as a company that this is basically the only way to be able to rapidly develop products and, and spin them off fast into multiple regions uh, with different requirements, uh, multiple configurations, even for various use cases uh, to serve different customer groups and, and different markets, basically. And if you would be designing one of products, then uh, you would have a hard time scaling up. And as we're looking to be a leading player in, in this complex EVSE industry, this is really what is necessary to make our products uh, scalable. Of course, that presents us with some challenges in keeping alignment within the development of our product lines and specific products and versions. So to this end, we use what we call visual brand language of which the product DNA Hugo talked about is, is really uh, key. A good example here uh, of this product DNA is our iconic lettering, which has been in the business line since 2010 as a basic HMI to indicate charging status and is applied today in, in Tronic or in uh, Icon and um, Elfi. Um, and we're also looking to process this, for example, into Ultronic and, and next generations uh, of products. Um, but <clears throat> this did not go easy, right? So we've really learned the hard way um, to by making mistakes, actually, by not including certain customer groups, by not uh, including certain markets in, in the beginning of product development, we, we really learned um, to take a hard and close look at our markets, which we want to serve and really doing user insights, infield research to get all the requirements on the table to make the next generation of meaningful products. So tell a little bit later on um, about this one in, on, the, on the next slide. Um, so, oh, sorry, can you skip back? Um, yeah, so the, so the last part, uh, the, the visual brand language and product DNA is really access as our North Star in, in defining our products. Uh, what we say, uh, the, the product DNA, which Hugo explained uh, quite well in detail, is really uh, the how behind the EV box, uh, box Y, and it helps us really to focus on our user journeys and, and stakeholders and their KPIs, and not only typical customers, uh, like installers or facility managers, but also the, the end user at the end of the day. Um, so if you could move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> to give you an example on, on what we're doing at EVbox and well, it clearly displays the case of the Icon product we're, uh, we're launching and manufacturing uh, right now in US and EU markets. Uh, I'd like to share some of the, the backgrounds here um, and take you on this iconic journey to explain this. So within EVbox in 2016, um, US markets uh, team had, had been uh, on, on the market and developing and they really gave us feedback uh, that there was a need for specific uh, new new products. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we started the infield uh, research in, in 2017 together with uh, Von Berlo, which is our design partner. Um, and we did the infield studies visiting multiple uh, commercial parking sites because that was one of the, the main topics to address for the, for the US team where they saw, as you can see in the pictures on the slide, that uh, the available products at the time uh, had some, some challenges. And, and so we visited multiple sites, we held user interviews, we uh, spoke to a wide variety of stakeholders and also did usability testing infield with actual EV drivers to see how they experienced the current products to 
get a clear view on their pains and gains, basically, for developing next generation product. And there's four main points which, which we took from that infield research, which really set the basis for the development of the, the new icon product. Um, and one, as you can clearly see in the picture is, is cable management. So what we, we found, because the US market is really predominantly or actually only focused on uh, fixed cable chargers, is that there was a lot of clutter and a lot of loose cables lying around, which were driven over, damaged, um, or vandalized in, in another way, just because the, the cable management systems were not there. And it's not strange, because as an EV driver, as a user, you want to charge your car. You don't want to coil up a cable which is uh, 25 feet long uh, after use because, hey, it's not your charger and you just want to charge a car. Um, so that was really one of, one of the main pains to, uh, to solve, uh, to create a user-friendly product which guides the user in, in the intended use and so that we, we steer them towards, hey, the cable needs to be somehow um, brought back to the product and, and the plug needs to be properly stored. Um, next to that, um, aesthetics was a key point. So we're, we're based in Amsterdam with our headquarters and we uh, have a relatively, let's say, European design vision, which, is, uh, which was a challenge to see what, what would work well in, in US markets. Um, but Bas Browning, uh, creative director from from Berlo, will will tell some more about the insights we got there. Um, also, the user interaction, which you can see on in the uh, displayed images, was uh, challenging because we saw a lot of cluttered information um, or missing on product data. Uh, so, th so the use cues, for example, for the user were were not that clear. And last but not least, uh, it's not a a visible part, but energy management and data communication uh, was often missing because they were non-connected products. And in this IoT world, we really see that you need to have a connected product to make it properly manageable, especially for commercial uh, charging solutions, which are owned and operated by commercial parties who do want to have data inside. So all in all, we, we took this these pains and we looked at the gains and we came up with the, uh, with the icon uh, proposition, uh, which basically ended up into a dual charger uh, for commercial charging with the auto retractable cable management system, which guides the user in, in its use of the product via uh, intuitive HMI um, with some on-screen steps, which are usable for first time users, but because uh, we may be EV enthusiasts, but uh, the rest of the world also needs to get there and will probably also be first time users once. So we help them in, in using the product, docking the plug back and locking them, really making it an easy to use system. Um, next to that, uh, we've processed some points on uh, ADA compliance. So uh, really designing the product to, to also be suitable for public space and disabled people. Um, and last but not least, the design and the, the setup are such that it's attractive for US market and EU markets, which we see coming back in the design awards we won for IF Red Dot and CES with the product. And I'm uh, oh, really happy to uh, introduce the, the product into US and EU markets this year. And I hope you can all experience the product uh, on short notice in real life. Thank you, Vainan. That was a really nice and detailed story and to um, kind of dive into the, the, the dichotomy between the US and the EU markets there. So thank you. Um, and as you mentioned, we're going to move into the next presentation, which is going to be by Bas Browning, who is currently the cre a creative director at Van Berlo. He has been working as a designer for over 15 years at a variety of design agencies um, and has experience uh, designing products like airport self-service kiosks, baggage drop-off systems, and especially EV charging stations. So this is a really great segue into the mind of the person who actually did help create our latest generation of products. So Bas, really looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, EVBox, for uh, making us part of this. Um, really proud to be a partner of EVBox, and um, um, yeah, we hope um, 
Um, and you know, we strive to have a continuing rela in relationship with you guys. Um, so um, yeah. So um, you know, if we have this brand personality, this is the the I think the bubble graph that um, uh, Hugo talked about. Um, obviously, that is not uh, enough to uh, be able to create a consistent portfolio. Um, why do we want a consistent portfolio? Well, actually, um, the consistent portfolio is actually more of a, um, a result from uh, the uh, design-driven thinking that uh, EVBox has, you know, incorporated. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's not only about the aesthetics of it, but that is what I will be talking about because, um, you know, it's, it's very presentable. So, so one of the things that we do when we uh, when we work with um, when, when when we work with these type of projects when we have to build a portfolio, um, it it's always becomes more difficult when the architecture of the uh, of the products is very different. And in this case, that is so. Um, you know, a, a very small product like LV has a very different architecture than, for instance, a very big product um, like an HPC or like uh, like Ica. So, so how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that they become one family? Well, the, the first thing that we do is we, we take these, um, uh, these personality traits and we turn them into visual components. So, um, and here, this is, a, this is an in-between step. Um, it's actually a quite a late step, but this is part of a document that we, that we have created that tells us how do we design these products. And um, I think uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you see this, this green iconic ring, which also Wijnand already talked about. And, and that is a very important part of the portfolio. And so, you know, whenever you see a, an EV box product, some resemblance of that ring will be present. Um, so um, it's, um, the, uh, it, it, it's very important that you know, we, whenever we design these products, even if they're produced at different sites, they all draw from the same well. And this, this well is, is captured in this, uh, in this document. And if we go to the next slide, we see how that manifests. So here indeed we see three products with very different architectures, but you, know, you don't have to be a designer to understand that they, they come from the same family. Yeah, so, so I think uh, if, if we, refer back to the, 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 the last slide, we see that there is an, an inner core that's dark and we see that in all three products. We have this robust shell that you know, displays reliability. And you know, this way, I think, and, and, and again, huh, th this is not a, uh, um, a goal in its own. This is just a, an, a result of how EVBox approaches their product development. And, and, and we as a design partner, we're, we're mainly um, talking about aesthetics, that is one of the roles that we represent, but also, of course, clever engineering, but also, of course, usability. And that's what um, I would like to talk about next in the next slide as well. So if we, like, um, if, if we look at these products, um, there, there's an interesting thing going on. Um, one of the things is that um, most users are returning users. Because you know, if you have uh, an electric vehicle, you're going to be, um, you know, coming back to these products, you know, every day, every two, three days. So, in in theory, only a very small percentage of the people who use these products are first-time users. But then again, right now, I think we're all dealing with early adopters who are curious about these products, who are resourceful when you know things don't work etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's that's why you know these these products that we have reviewed in the united states who are you know less than intuitive i would say but you know they still worked because these people um you know they were just fit for using these unintuitive products i think as we're moving to a new era where you know the masses will probably adopt electric vehicles you know we have to be we have to make these products in a way that they're very easy to use but then again, we have a lot of returning users. So how do we deal with those sort of opposing preferences, right? The, the returning users, they want everything to be fast and they want no hassle. Whereas the first time users, you know, they, they have, uh, yeah, they, they're all uh, confronted with new anxieties like range anxiety or, you know, uncertainty. How do I use this? Am I going to be able to charge my car? Does my card, does it work with this, this charger specifically? 
you know, those kind of things. So for that, we, we sort of created this, this extra layer. Um, so the, the normal, what we call the happy flow is a very easy use flow. So it's, it's, it's here displayed um, in the user interface. It's, it, it's very easy, it's very intuitive. You almost have to do nothing, right? Because you, you basically have to get the plug, put it in your car and, and, it, and it automatically starts charging. However, if you're new to this, you might not really understand what you need to do. And for that, we have this I button that you see in the left-hand side corner. Um, uh, so if you press that, that button, you know, you'll go to a step-by-step -step process that helps you sort of um, uh, guide you through the whole charging process. And, um, you know, even for instance, and maybe an interesting detail here is that, you know, if the, the machine or the, the charger recognizes that you haven't been doing anything for a while, even though maybe you have already presented your card, but after that, you sort of got stuck into nothingness, it will present that extra layer by itself. Right? So, it, so, it, so it understands, well, maybe this person needs a little bit of extra help. Um, a little bit maybe like the paperclip that we are used to from, uh, from Windows back in the day. Um, so, so that is talking about the EV driver, which is an end user. But actually, if we go to the next slide, um, there's a different end user as well. And you know, those are the surface and maintenance workers. And, and uh, I think uh, Hugo already talked about this. You know, the, it's, it's the whole industry that we wanna target. So we don't wanna focus only on the end users. We don't wanna focus only on these, these people who have a professional relationship with it. We, we wanna do both, right? So I think in, in our designs, and, and a lot of that is you know, below the surface, um, but there's a lot of design decisions that are being made to be able to, 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 to make, have an optimal work experience for these um, uh, surface uh, workers. And um, so, you know, and, and then we're talking about different things. We're talking about easy access. Um, you know, they, they want a pleasant, but also a fast workflow. Um, you know, you can imagine if you have to surface these products and, you know, it's, um, you know, the weather conditions might not, not always be sunny outside. So, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of design decisions that, you know, we take into account when, when uh, uh, yeah, to really make that, um, uh, you know, that, that sort of complex relationship that these people have with these products um, less strainful. Um, uh, so um, with that, I think um, uh, we went a little bit into detail. So a little bit, get a little bit of insights in, in, in the process that we've gone through. And um, well, I hope that that inspired you uh, um, to, uh, to, to have build a relationship with EVBox. And uh, over to you, Jennifer, thank you. Thanks, Bas, for all of those little details that make us appreciate good product design that much more. Uh, at this time, I'd like to start opening up some audience questions so we can have all of our speakers back on here. Um, if you haven't had a chance to put some questions in, you can still put them in because we'll have another Q&A section at the end. But actually, I already have a couple of questions here for you. Um, the first question is from Ryan, and the question is, how much have you had to sacrifice in product design for the internal components of the station to be maintained? So maybe that can go to either Vinand or Bas if you want to take that question. Well, I, I can share something of that. Um, yes, you, you need to sacrifice some in design due to functionality, but our products are not form follows function uh by default um so we we really try to walk this balance between uh, the, what you see from the product dna sophisticated design and uh, being able to accommodate for all the all the products um especially as the products get smaller but maybe boss you like to share something about that but if if they get smaller that gets more challenging and with an icon it's it's a bigger product for commercial charging outdoors so you have more room, but for example, in LV, yeah, yeah, definitely more challenging. Yeah, yeah. If, if I can add to that, I think um, you know context in this case is is very leading. So um, uh, you know, if if you design an LV, you have to understand that people have to um, uh, put this on their on their house on their houses, right? So um, uh, then obviously size becomes a very important feature. Um, 
when we're designing a, a product that is more in public space or you know is, is, is more of a business oriented product um, you know the size may be less relevant so so I think um, you know it, it very much much depends on the context um, the same goes for the aesthetics obviously the aesthetics have to be appealing in some way but they you know you don't want them to attract uh, unnecessary attention um, you know the they, these products live in public space um, and and that is a very important aspect that that we use um, in these uh, in these products uh, then again uh, obviously as designers we always have some tricks up our sleeve to make products look smaller even though they are quite big so um, you know that is that is uh, some things that we use as well um, so they appear a little bit smaller than they than they might actually be secrets to design right there um, all right, great. Thanks for the answers there. Um, we have a second question, um, and that question is about um, EV Box design. Um, are there any differences in EV Box's design approach between creating AC versus DC charging stations? I wonder who is interested in taking that question. I can probably take that question, um, I, I, and I think I think uh, I, I've already answered a little bit of that in the previous question. Obviously, um, you know the, the DC products are general. I mean, they, they are uh, uh, from from the get go. They're way larger than the AC chargers. So um, you know we have to make sure that um, their size doesn't become something that works against us. And 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 context again is is the important uh, bit here. Um, but you know, if, if we look at the, the the HPC products, so the high power charging products, obviously, um, the, where they are positioned, um, uh, you know, that you you ha you expect different things. So um, you know, the, um, making a, a very, for instance, voluptuous design uh, on a product that you know is is, is positioned in uh, next to the highway, um, you know, makes no sense. It just uh, makes the product you know maybe look a little bit ridiculous because they're so big. Whereas, I mean, if you make the, the LV, um, you know, a very much form follows function, uh, you know, it might be that uh, they, um, you know, they, they may not be as suitable and not be as uh, desired as, as we want them to. Yeah, it will have to be a bit of a balance, it sounds like, at the end of the day. Um, there's a lot of different factors to put into play and the environment is clearly one of them as well. Um, great. So we're going to actually put a hold to the, the audience questions for a bit because I'd love to hear from another poll, um, which is going to be our third and last poll um, from all of you here. And this poll has to do with uh, which innovation are you most excited about seeing in the future? So if you haven't guessed, the last portion of our webinar is going to be about the future of EVSC product design. So I wanted to hear from you, what types of innovations are you the most excited about seeing next? And in the meantime, I'm just going to take a look at the answers out there. Um, there's different options like V2G, V2X, wireless charging is a very hot topic these days. We can go further into the voice activation realm. There really is um, so much opportunity out there. In the meantime, I'd also like to remind you all that if you have other questions that come up during the last portion of the webinar, do please go ahead and ask them in the chat. All right, so the innovations that we're most excited for, number one is wireless charging at 37% and number two at V2G and V2X. So those seem to be clear. What I find interesting that voice activation is not part of it. So. Let's maybe take that as the basis of our discussion to start off. We're going to have all three speakers available. Um, so the first question, we're just going to keep it broad and open. Uh, how do you see customer needs evolving in the future? And how do you think that will impact charging station designs? So I'm actually going to throw this uh, first off to Ugo. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a, a great question. Yeah, the customer needs always have to be taken into consideration for future development. Um, I would say that the design influence in the future will be mostly behind the scenes rather than in front of it. Of course, there is an evolution on how uh, certain regulations in the US and Europe might require certain developments on public charging, being it the payment methods or how the station allows and facilitates payment uh, on, on a charging station. 
to potentially, you know, uh, with the plug and charge uh, uh, methodology or the ISO 15118 that might evolve, meaning that the car is the leading element to connect with the station. So all those elements will evolve the, the, the impact on the station design, of course, because then it will, it will adjust how much you need, maybe a screen, maybe not a screen. So the fit for, for purpose makes sense. However, I would see the design of charging stations to enable certain integrations on the back end with new business models, such as energy management systems or fleet applications, where it you know might not change the design of the charging station, but does change the way it works and the way it's integrated on the daily life of a user. So that's that's where I see potential evolution on a charging station design, more from a, a way it works, but not the way it it, it looks like and designs. Despite that, of course, we see more and more well-designed charging stations in the market. Okay, interesting. Bas and Vainan, do either of you have a response to that? Well, maybe to add to, to Hugo's story and also to get back to, to, to Bas's presentation. Um, once we cross the chasm to, to mass market adoption of, of EV charging, real ease of use is, is really going to be key in, in products. And especially uh, if you need to use them fast on a highway or yeah, use them regularly on a daily basis in a residential situation, for example. And there, um, well, it's good to see in the poll that wireless charging came up. That, that may be one way to facilitate ease of use because you just drive over your car starts charging. But on the back end side and, and from a protocol side, the uh, ISO 15118 plug and charge, what we're already working on today uh, or, and, and some of our competitors are too, is really, uh, really a first big step in, in ease of use because then we have our, our cars identify themselves on the charger and on the networks and all the processing happens uh, happens automatically. So I really think ease of use um, is, is a key factor towards um, mass market adoption. Great. And that really ties it back down to the poll at the beginning when ease of use was the number one uh, factor that people found important in EV charging product design. Right, so um, I have another question to pop up here. Um, and it has come quite a bit because I also see the requests coming in from different um, customers in the market. And that has to do with uh, the idea of customization for each uh, customer. So I want to ask you guys, what is the relevance or importance of customization? And how do you think the product design can cater for it? So maybe we can start with um, Boss this time. Yeah, so I uh, indeed we we see that customization becomes more and more important in these, uh, and and I think, um, uh, although, um, you know, I think what when we when we started off in the beginning, um, you know, I think the the designs were very brand driven, right? Um, uh, so uh, you know, you 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 want to be out there. It's it's a, it's an emerging market, um, and and you know, you or it's 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 a growing market, and and it's very new. So you know everybody wants to make a make amends, I guess, right? So um, you know I, I think uh, being bold and making statements was something that you saw in the beginning. However, um, you know as we're moving forward and uh, as each products become um, more uh, or the, the amounts of products uh, they become more and more, um, you know we want to maybe move away from these from these bolder statements and you know um, uh, go more into more generic designs and you know it's it's and i think we're if, if you look at the, the the range of products um you know you already see that happening a little bit and um i think i think that is something that will continue ongoing i don't think that is something that will be only a challenge for ev books but it will be a challenge for everybody to to see how we can make these products fit for purpose um so rather fit for context rather than, uh, than, than um, you know, making these products as, as they were objects and, and, and that carry a brand. Um, however, you know, as, as Evibox, as a brand, you know, you will still want to be present. You know, you want to, you want to have uh, some say in it. So, so how we deal uh, with, with that, um, you know, with that discrepancy um, uh, is, is, is very interesting. Um, I think the, the, the LED ring that, that we have introduced uh, a, a couple of years ago, could play a, a really interesting part in that. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, the, um, the demand for customizable products um, up to a high level, um, uh, we see that happening. And uh, 
I think we are trying to prepare our products in a way that our customers can have, you know, their their products, but still recognize this as a as you know as an EV box service at least. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, Ugo or Vina, if you have any comments to add on about that. If you agree, disagree, it would be great to hear. Yeah, maybe I would bring two two angles, which might not necessarily have an answer, but I do see that customization and if you can call it brandability, it matters for customers where the brand expression matters to them, where they also want to showcase their voice, their values, and ultimately be in touch with the customer. Then customization makes a difference. And I'm talking purely from a brand expression point of view and not from flexibility of adjusting the hardware to their own needs in terms of power output or, or specific requirements of the market, of the local market. So in that way, where a market is in a position where customers or, or companies and businesses want to also express their brand, then we do need to take that into consideration uh, when building our, at least the business model of Vivibox, where you want to activate and empower partners around the world. The, the way I see it is that for a company and maybe beyond the EV industry, you always have to choose which kind of brand you want to be known of. And sometimes everyone wants to be a known powerhouse consumer brand worldwide, but maybe sometimes you have to make smarter choices, especially in the industry that is growing fast and you have to make choices. So I, I do see many times that, um, that uh, I do like the story of Intel, for example, where you have the Intel inside in many computers and, and, and even today and for a, for a large period of time, decades, Intel is known that if you buy a computer independently of the hardware, when you see that there is Intel inside, there is a connotation of a brand to it, either being reliability, power, um, trust, it, it comes a lot with it. And it comes in a lot of like the, you know, the people that are selling around the world being Asus and Acer. So there is an element of Evox of being wanted to be maybe an Intel insight in the sense that people understand that this is another provider, but there is a brand power of reliability, of intelligence, of accessibility of our DNA that is there, that customers know about that. There's in one element. On the other hand, we do value design also in how it looks and how it works, a bit like maybe the Apple approach to things. And maybe that's our differentiator. We also want to, you know, to offer that feeling of having an Apple uh, kind of approach to the, you know, to the customers that want to serve the drivers and businesses around the world. So maybe that's the element of brand expression we are looking at. And, and it's a hard balance between both, but we do want to play that game. Yeah, I, I know that we're probably not the only company um, on this webinar right now. There are other competitors out there. Um, so I would simply say a call to you is, do you know which company, which product, um, and which brand you're trying to model after? Are you trying to be more of an Apple? Are you trying to be more of an Intel? And I think as we all find our, um, find our space in this ecosystem, it's going to be more obvious about how our partnerships work together from there. Uh, very cool. So I'd like to move into a couple of audience questions now. So I have a question here, and it has to do with the product DNA. So actually, back to Ugo here. Um, does the EVBox product DNA and design principles also apply for the software products, such as charging management software? Yeah, they do. They definitely do apply to it. Maybe with the software, I would say that maybe the bubbles that you saw in the presentation might go in different directions. Yeah. So, for example, sophistication in a software concept might not be the same as in a hardware concept. Sophistication in software might be more about how user friendly it is, how easy to use and set up the, the charging management network it is, how easy it is to customize and brand it. That's the sophistication element of it. And um, so there might be different elements to it. But it does speak the same language, yeah? It has to be accessible and easy to use. It has to be reliable in the sense of like, we do want to operate a network. It has to have a high uptime because people cannot have, you know, the technology down and not be able to serve their network. They have to trust that, you know, whatever is built and reported as usage of what you charge has to be true and accurate. Um, but for example, in a software world where innovation is being demanded with integration of energy management systems, payment methods, smart charging, maybe I would say the intelligence and imagination might play a bigger role in the near future than the other ones, but that might be more of a personal assessment than a reality. But I would say that it does apply on the principles of everything we do beyond the hardware, um, but might be different elements of it uh, in, when you low, go more in depth and in detail. But yeah, I would say so. 
Yeah, I don't know if either of uh, Bas or Vinan also have a comment on this, but it's cr quite clear that when it talks, we're talking about the product DNA, these are characteristics. And these can be translated to any objects or any um, tangible entity out there as well. Yeah, I think the manifestation might be indeed like this is also what we were saying, the manifestation might be different. Uh, so indeed, uh, something like sophistication or reliability, um, you know, if, if, if you talk about aesthetics or, or product architecture, you know, it's, it's, it's very much about how the, the, the product is built up and, you know, how people perceive it even when, when, when they interact with it. However, you know, if, if you talk about sophistication, indeed, in, 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 in a usability context or a complex usability context, you know, obviously that, that is different. Um, and, um, but, but I think what, what's interesting is that when you talk about usability, um, you know, it's, it, it doesn't only talk about the on-screen usability. I think that is what people often think about. You know, they think about apps and they think about, about, about user interfaces. But I think, I think what we are trying to do is we're trying to merge um, those two elements. So, you know, there's a physical usability aspect and there's a, there's a digital usability aspect and they all draw from the same well. And, and I think that is captured in the design DNA document. Yeah. And, and that also relates back to the whole uh, platform technology based ecosystems approach. Eh? It's, we're not just selling boxes to charge cars. We're basically selling a uh, piece of charging uh, infrastructure linked, linked to a backend services, linked to physical services. And that all wrapped together uh, need, needs to work at the end of the day and, and needs to also match our, uh, our product DNA. Yeah, so then we're looking, um, like you just said, not just at does this apply to hardware, does this apply to software, but really does it apply to the entire solutions ecosystem that any EV charging company is trying to present to the world. Very cool. Uh, I have one last question, actually, it's from my side. Um, I've been seeing that there uh, in, in some in some different types of products around the world. There's usually a branch out in terms of a lot of customization, a lot of different types of charging stations or let's say products around the world. The other side is when they all start simplifying and consolidating into a very similar shape. Like we don't have Blackberries as much anymore. We don't have um, you know, the brick old phones. We all, every every uh, mobile phone looks the same now. So I want to ask actually, do you think that in the future, the portfolio of EV charging stations are all going to be all streamlined to eventually look like something similar, or you think they're going to stay diverse and um, grow in that manner? And this question's to everyone. Yeah, maybe maybe a, a takeaway from my side. <clears throat> I think from a, from an internals point of view, and from a hardware point of view, then you need to split AC and DC charging because you have different different requirements for power electronics, but there you could keep it the same uh, and, and you could, could consolidate, consolidate to, to similar architectures, which is something we're doing today. Um, but we'll always see diversifications in, into markets, into countries, just based on standards and, and, and rules and regulations, right? So we have our type one plugs in Europe or type two plugs in Europe, type one plugs in the US. We have CCS for Enchidemo and Chargy coming up for uh, as a new standard. So we always need to cater to those for instance, but the heart of the system, uh, although partially split between AC and DC can, can definitely be consolidated into a more um, unanimous uh, approach or, or platform. Yeah. So like one, one body and then multiple variants that can be adapted to markets. Um, I don't know if Bas and Ugo, you have something very, very quick to say as we're coming to the end of our webinar. I, I think uh, Vinod wrapped it up really well, actually. So Perfect. leave it at that. Yeah. And Ugo, do you also agree? Mm, yeah, I'll agree. Vinod wrapped up really nicely. <laughs> Perfect. Then at this time, I'd like to thank Bas, Ugo, and Vainan. Thank you so much for coming out to our webinar today. Um, our next webinar is going to be uh, this webinar you see on the screen here, which is going to focus on insights from the Central Eastern, uh, Eastern European market. So we've heard a lot about North America. We've heard a lot about Europe, Western Europe. So the next time we're going to be hearing some, some stories and insights from people who are working in those regions to build up EV charging there and they'll be available to answer your questions during the virtual Q&A areas as well. 
So thank you again to all the speakers. Thank you again to all of you for participating in the webinars, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everyone.